folks, it's Jeff Fuzzy Wenzel from the Woodshed Agency, and you're listening to a new episode of Successfully Funded. Here we go. Let's turn it up. Turn it up. Yeah! crowdfunders how's everybody doing out there in the beautiful wonderful land of crowdfunding i am your host jeff fuzzy wenzel ceo of woodshed agency and this is our podcast Uh, we call it successfully funded and what we try to do here is we try to talk to project creators while they're in the middle of a crowdfunding campaign or their campaign has just finished up and that way we can give you guys the most up-to-date information but today well, today's a little bit of a different episode we are going to be re-airing um uh, episode 170 Um, so this was, I released this out in March, but I thought it'd be good to bring it back in for a lot of people who may not have heard it yet. Um, and we're gonna be talking to, uh, Elizabeth Erickson and she is an associate attorney over at Quinn IP law. And why I decided to have Elizabeth on back in March, um, was I thought this would be a great conversation around litigation, trademarks, copywriting, brand management, licensing agreements, all of these things that are super crucial for, uh, for a lot of startup companies. And it's something that might be a step that might be missed or a step that's not being thought of. So that's what we're going to be doing today. We're going to be re-airing that uh, episode 170 here in just a little bit. But before we get to that, what's going on over in One Wenzel Way world? Not going to lie. Today's Thursday and the neck is hurting. I slept on it weird. So I have this like kink thing that's going on. Um, as soon as I get done with this intro, you know, I'm going to go see if maybe the... Uh, the the old lady the old wife out there can uh can maybe uh, you know just push on a little bit because man is it just and it could be part of the fact that um well went to uh had our first he-man club adventure last night and i know i probably just said something there and you're like what are you talking about so it's a secret this is just a little bit of a podcast facebook live secret um yeah, we've got a new He-Man club, and that's exactly what it sounds like. And it's for uh, just a couple of guys to get together and enjoy a nice cigar and, and maybe a little bit of bourbon. And that happened last night, so that was nice. That was the first one of those where we got those kicked off. Again, it's it's cold out, you know. We don't want to have to have to build a fire every single time and be cavemen. So, you know, you we've got a space, and you just go and you chill and you hang out. And that was last night. So I did have a couple bourbons. I don't think that that's what's going on with my neck because the neck is, it feels more like I just, <sighs> this is what it's like though, right? This is what it's like struggling to be a, uh, to be a, uh, you know, to, I don't even know what I'm talking about. What am I talking about right now? So what else is going on in the news? Well, we are just, you know, getting going here. It, you know, we're r- ramping up to this new year. We're figuring out a bunch of new things we've had. Uh, a lot of data sort of came in at the end of last year. Um, we're working on a couple things where we're really trying to focus on personalization in our marketing efforts. Um, we have seen just an absolute oversaturation, especially in like the equity crowdfunding space recently, where the things we were doing six months ago, a year ago, even a year and a half ago, just are not producing the same results. So we're standing back and we're really focusing our efforts on this. How do we continue to personalize the experience for somebody? And that may be through dynamic content on websites. Um, it can be dynamic content uh, inside of LinkedIn. It can be uh, personalization inside of emails. So that is like super, super focused. And I'm talking about that today because I think it's something that, again, if you guys are starting to think about what your strategies are going to look like for this year for either your crowdfunding campaign or your startup or your e-commerce, it's how are you putting personalization into this strategy? And I'm not just talking about, hey, when I send out a broadcast, I put the first name in there, right? Like a broadcast email. I'm talking about the entire journey is personalized to that person through through the data that you might have on them. Um, so I think that that is something that's like crucially, uh, crucially, uh, what am I saying? I think it's gonna be crucial for next year. Um, so it's something that we're focused on right now. We're looking at tools like Hyperize, Lemless, um, these tools that allow this personalization. So um, I'm going to be doing a ton of case studies here uh, over the next few weeks, just trying to, because we're, we're, we're figuring it out all together. So I want to talk about this today because again, I, you know, if I'm going to be doing an episode where we're rebroadcasting, I wanted to kind of bring something to you guys that um, uh, that is something that maybe you guys can be thinking about. Just think about that personalization in your own marketing efforts. Um, and I'm also interested, if you guys are working on stuff like that, like 
I'd love to hear what you guys are working on. You know, so let's share, let's share some information back and forth. Um, I think that would be really, really crucial uh, for, for us and for you guys to just see what, what new strategies we might be able to do moving forward into 2021 that, uh, that helps get the, re get the results we want. So other things going on. Um, so I've talked a lot about, you know, go stuff going on in the old dad world over this last year. If you guys have been a regular listener, you guys know, um, you know, that, you know, he passed away back in February. Um, but over the last, uh, couple, um, you know, couple weeks or so I went out really trying to put music sort of back into the life again, got a, you know, got a record player, got a tube amp, got some speakers, you know, just really kind of going back to the basics, right? You know, even though I also have Spotify and Tidal and all of those stuff, but you know, just going back to the basics of like, um, of content. So I ended up getting my, my, my dad and my mom's like record collection. You know, they've, I don't know, it's got probably 50 records, maybe, maybe a little bit more, maybe 60. But we noticed that like a lot of them are comedy records, right? So and I know I'm going to say something here in a second that like you probably can't say in 2021, but my dad had a ton of Bill Cosby records, like a ton. I mean, I think we have like 20 Bill Cosby records, it feels like maybe even, you know, maybe 18, 20, something like that. Just a ton of Bill Cosby records. Um, so, you know, I, my dad, I think, had a sense of humor, right? We think he had a, uh, you know, I know he had a sense of humor. It wasn't around for like the last 10 years when he was sick, but, you know, we, we were pretty we know he had a sense of humor, but it's been intriguing on how much he loved Bill Cosby. So Tuesday, my sister and I were uh, sitting around um, after some after some dinner, and I actually put on a Bill Cosby record, <laughs> comedy record. Um, yeah, it was uh, it was an experience. It was something where I was like, man, I uh, yeah, uh, uh, okay. My dad was I guess sitting around listening to this stuff back in the you know mid seventies. I don't know, but I got a lot of Bill Cosby records. Also, some Flip Wilson. I'm not exactly sure who Flip Wilson is. I, 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 I'm sure very popular. I just, you know, uh, I don't know Flip Wilson that much. Got some of those records. Got some Lily Tomlin. So a good amount of comedy, and then sprinkled in, you've got the uh, some classics of like Black Sabbath's first record and Fleetwood Mac Rumors and a lot of Bob Seger. That's the other thing too. Is I tell you what, I've also I've learned Bob Seger. Whew, it's a good band, better band than I anticipated. So. Um, so that's been an interesting exploration journey, um, you know, diving into these old records and, uh, and just sitting down and just listening to hear, uh, you know, what my, uh, what my, my dad might've been listening to back in the day. Right. You know, just trying to, trying to explore, trying to figure out stuff. Um, so that's been an interesting journey this week as well, but man, we have got an interesting show today. I also forgot to tell you guys who our musical guest is. So uh, this is, uh, again, about six years ago. This is a band called The Sun Pilots that uh, came into Groovebox Studios. Oh, and by the way, if, this, if you're not familiar with Groovebox Studios, this was uh, about a seven-year project, six, seven-year project between with, with Sean and I, um, where we recorded bands live, one take, multiple mics, multiple cameras. We recorded everything. Sometimes there'd be a studio audience. Most of the time there's a studio audience and we crowdfunding every campaign. So the content that we're gonna be showing at the end of these episodes is the, our musical guest is, uh, is, is bands that I was recorded. So this band, the Sun Pilots, they came in from, actually they came in from Australia um, to do a GBS session. And it was uh, a really, really good time and a, just a phenomenal four piece band. So make sure you guys stay tuned after the episode because I'm gonna be sharing one of those songs that we recorded about six years ago from, from that band. So, um, so that's coming up, that's coming up here in just a little bit. But before we get into that, if you are thinking about running a crowdfunding campaign, you got to do a couple things here. One, don't just launch it without knowing what you're getting into. Uh, I recommend just go to, go to our website, woodshed.agency. Um, click on the blog section, the podcast section. Uh, if you guys are regular listeners, you know, we've got tons and tons of episodes that you guys can go out and, and dive into and listen, listen, you know, uh, I always like the Judge Judy saying uh, around, uh, you know, God gave you two ears and one mouth for a reason. Listen. <laughs> so go and really listen to these episodes and take in that information. That's why we do it, right? It, it's why we put these out uh, a couple times a week because we want you guys to get really good information. Um, second thing is make sure you're a subscriber, man. Smash that subscribe button. Smash it. Smash it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I pushed the wrong button. I wanted this one. <laughs> Sorry, 
Hey, I've only had two episodes where I've had the ability to do sound effects. So I'm going to do those. I'm going to do those sound effects. Um, but again, make sure you go over, you smash that subscribe button. Um, and, and wherever you're getting it, whether it's iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or if you're over watching this on YouTube, I, I don't care, Facebook, it doesn't matter where you're watching it. Just make sure you're a subscriber so that way you're getting a notification before it happens. And last but not least, you know, if you're before you launch your campaign, go to that consultation tab on our, my website, the woodshed.agency website. And literally pick a time out of my calendar and talk to me. I'm not going to sell you anything. I'm just going to talk and we're going to see what you guys dare to be doing or where you should be going. Because sometimes it's not right for crowdfunding. Sometimes it might be Shopify. Sometimes it might be just, you know, you're just not going to be doing crowdfunding at all. So um, so there's a lot to kind of take in. So with all that said, um, super excited for this uh, episode. Uh, this was a great conversation. Uh, that I had back in March, um, and I, there was so much valuable information. So again, I'm encouraging you guys to get probably some notepads out for this uh, for this interview. Um, if you want to go back and listen to the original one of this, go back to episode 170. Again, you can find that on iTunes or or, or Woodshed Agency, wherever it's it's out there. Um, but yeah, Elizabeth was a great conversation, and it was super exciting to kind of dive into the the back end world of of um, of of you know of, of, of litigation and uh, brand management and all that sort of stuff. So, all right, guys, with all that said, why don't we go ahead and jump into my interview uh, with Elizabeth um, Erickson from, uh, she's an attorney at Quinn Law, Quinn IP Law. So if you guys want to go check that out right now, and if you want to reach out to her, by the way, um, if you go to our show notes, emails in there, reach out to her and she'll be more than happy to help. All right, here's my interview. Turn it up. Yeah! All right, Elizabeth. So the red light's on, and I'm sure you're like totally freaking out now because it's like, oh my gosh, is it, we're recording. It's oh no, I'm I'm, I'm calm. <laughs> oh, calm, all good. Okay, let's do a quick sound check. Um, so I asked this question to everybody: What'd you have for breakfast this morning? Oh man, I actually didn't have breakfast this morning. What? <laughs> some coffee. <laughs> okay. All right. Anything fancy in that coffee? Just uh, just some straight. No, coffee. I I like my coffee black. You know, I think I, okay. I grew out of that. Okay. I used to like the um. A stupid big beef coffee drink with all sure. the sugar which was no coffee whatsoever <laughs> right, right and then yeah you know, now i now i drink it just black i you know, have a, a european adventure so <laughs> okay all right all right so yeah so n nothing too fancy this morning huh i will say i did not no. have any breakfast this morning as well i was uh i was hustling and bustling so uh I was in and oh out. i thought you were giving me shit for that <laughs> nope, not at all nope i'm right there with okay. you I, I did the exact same same thing you did. Um, well, cool. I think we're sounding good. So why don't we why don't we just jump in and kind of maybe introduce yourself and and talk about what you do um, to help uh, project creators uh, uh, get patents and stuff. Tell, tell us what you do. All right, great. Uh, well, my name is Elizabeth Erickson. I am an intellectual property attorney at Quinn IP Law. And uh, just as a little caveat, the opinions expressed in this post are my own and not those of my employer. <laughs> um, just had a little legal disclaimer on there. Yeah. Um, so what I do as an intellectual property attorney is I have the honor and privilege of working with um, small companies, startups, and large companies. Uh, people come to me with their ideas and they say, you know, I want to do this. And um, sometimes people don't even know what it is exactly that they want out of the law, but they mm -hmm. say, you know, this is my idea. What do I need from you? And then it's my job to take that idea and explain to them, you know, with strategies and tools that can be used in the law to help protect and carve out that right for them and ha give them the biggest protection possible and allow them to profit from their idea. Um, so I think intellectual property is the coolest type of law out there. I love working with it. I often joke we're like the one lawyer that people want to see because sure. no one's there because they're going through something negative. They're not there. It's not criminal. It's not divorce. You know, they're, people get excited to see me. So it's kind of different uh, yeah. than, yeah. That's cool. When in like the stage of, let's say I'm a guy, I, I made something in my garage, I made a widget, you know, when am I starting to seek out, you know, help, like what you do? Like, when, when do I come to you? Is it like day one? Is it, uh, you got to come a little bit later? Like when, when should somebody come to you? 
So it depends exactly what you want. If you, you might be a guy who already has an invention or you might just want like a business name so you can start creating things under that name. So it kind of depends on what exactly you're looking for. So a short answer uh, to that without getting more specific is the very lawyerly answer of <laughs> it depends. Um, so if, if it's an idea that you're talking about, which frequently people will say, you know, I have an invention, it does X, Y, Z, um, you want it to be in a concrete enough form that I could take it and put it into writing. Um, so you want to be able to have an invention that is solid enough. And then I would walk them through what exactly a criteria for a patent would look like. Mm. And correct me if I'm wrong, is there different sort of stages of a of like patents? Like, um, you know, especially if you're getting ready to maybe do like a Kickstarter or Indiegogo, do you, are you trying at that point to be fully protected all over the globe or are you getting like a patent pending? Like what are kind of the differences of those types of things? So the, there's so many things. Um, and what I would do as an intellectual property attorney is sit down with that person and discuss with them, you know, what's feasible, what, like, what monetary constraints do you have? What, um, you know, and, and as a company too, you'd want to ask yourself some of these questions beforehand. You know, you'd want to look at your long-term and short-term goals if you see yourself selling this product only in the United States for a time, you know, you, it may, it's not going to be worth your while and worth the amount of expense to have a patent that expands the entire globe, you know? Mm -hmm. And even then, most, even huge companies, um, you know, I, I just was at a seminar uh, it's called the World Trademark Review, and, you know, we had huge companies um, like Microsoft and Harley Davidson, and they were saying, you know, we have to justify that expense. So a lot of companies operate on a zero balance budget which means they have zero and then they have to go to you know their boss or whomever and say this is what we want to do this is the value of it and justify that expense to them um so it, you know they don't usually patent an invention in every single part of the world right. and sometimes right. there's reasons why you can't there might be an invention that already exists in a certain country um so you're not necessarily always able to take your idea or your trademark name or what have you and develop it into a country because it might already have exist. Um, so for trademarks, it's interesting because um, certain things might not be allowed because it might be viewed as immoral mm -hmm. or it might be geographically descriptive in a certain region. So there's bars to entry in every single country that vary by location. So like um, if you wanted to go patent something in the Middle East, um, like the moral rights that something might be viewed as immoral might be different than what is in the United States. So right. we frequently see right. things like that. And it's, it's really interesting. And that's why I love what I do so much because it, it's just a ever involving an interesting area of law. Yeah, that's cool. Now, if I'm the guy that is, you know, again, I made my widget, I'm bringing it to you. How in depth are you getting in terms of like, what is patentable about this? I don't know. I've got like a heated jacket or something like that. Is it like, we've got to take it all the way apart? Are you know, you're using a little bit of this other product that exists? Like, like, how are you taking this thing on? You will, I'm, I'm, you're going to own this, right? Like, this is your thing. Yeah, like, so, how in depth so I, is well, so technically I'm not a patent attorney. I okay. do specialize in litigation and trademarks, but I okay. would um, give it to somebody else who would then look at it, the specific nature of it. And it depends too. So the, the first thing, um, that we usually do for any type of intellectual property is we'll do a search to conduct what already exists out there. So um, just to avoid infringement, we technically rec typically recommend that we do a search just to make sure, you know, you're not trying to reinvent the wheel. And you won't be able to be barred from getting something that already exists out there. Right. Um, so then right. based on the nature of what already exists, um, there's ways to carve out a right of yours that's different than what already, what already is out there. And we might make recommendations um, based on things that are already out there and what you want, say, oh, you know, um, this, is, this is out there, but if you were to change it in this aspect, then you could have an invention that would be more likely to be eligible to be granted patent protection. Hmm. Walk me through, because um, you said something just a minute ago, the differences about what you do compared to what other people do. Like, just what are the two differences? Or, or I guess there's probably so, more than two, but what are the two differences there? Yeah, so, so perhaps I should uh, back up even further and yeah. just give a broad <laughs> overview of intellectual property. So, yeah. um, you know, that's terms not exactly taught to you in public schools, and it's, right. uh, it's becoming an area of increasing importance in today's business and technological world. It's like something like $750 billion annually. So really anybody who doesn't understand what intellectual property is, is kind of going to be left in the dust. And it's mm. crucial if you're trying to create a business because the protections you carve out 
um, are just essential for a patent portfolio. If you've ever seen Shark Tank, yeah. the sharks will always say, yeah. oh, do you have a patent on that? And mm -hmm. the reason why they ask that is because if you don't, you're now presenting on national television and you know who knows, someone can come by and steal it if they think right. it's a great idea right. to do. So, um, so IP or intellectual property is the non-tangible personal property. Um, they're creations of the mind. It can be inventions, literary and artistic works, images and designs used in commerce. Um, and so legal protections are given to these inventors to help protect their innovation, to allow them to continue to create and give them the incentive to innovate. Um, and there's different types of IP that have different types of protections. So trademarks, um, something I specialize in, are the trade names. There are any word, name, symbol, um, or combination used in commerce to indicate a source of the goods. So, you know, I'm sure you can think of a couple of yeah. brand names off the top of your head, and it's just yeah. it, the image that you associate with it, the type of quality, that's, that's what you want when you have a trademark. Um, and they could potentially, uh, potentially last indefinitely. So if you continue to keep up with your renewals um, with the United States Patent and Trademark Office or USPTO, a trademark could last forever. Mm. Um, then we have, oh, did you, did you have no, 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 go ahead. I was, I was, I was, I, I just thought of something, but no, just keep, keep going with it. Cause I, I, I have a, I have a question that's coming, but yeah, keep going with it. Okay. Yeah. So, so we generally say there's four main types. So trademarks are one, uh, another form is copyright. Um, and that's a form of protection provided to authors of original works, mm -hmm. um, in a fixed and any tangible medium of expression, and it can be published or unpublished. So this can be a useful tool for someone without a ton of money since a copyright is created from the second that it's formed. So if you, you know, t writing uh, like your notes or whatever, it has to be a su of a sufficient uh, quality and nature. It can't just be like, you know, really short, like you can't own like, my name is Bob, you know, that's too short. I'm not eligible, but it's technically what, when you write something, it's created at the moment it's expressed. Um, so that lasts for the life of the author plus seven years, and it doesn't prevent independent creation of an identical work, which is an interesting thing. So it's not going to be quite as broad as maybe some other things. Um, so that's why we get creative with our strategy. Um, but it is definitely a good option for people um, to have a copyright. And then patents are the big one. Um, most people want a patent. Um, and this is a right for an invention that permits the owner to exclude others uh, from making, using, offering to sell, importing. Um, so that's usually the big one. Um, and there's a couple different types. There's utility, plant, and design patents. And then the big last one is trade secrets. And that's pretty much what it sounds like. It, you know, hush, hush. Don't grandma's, re grandma's recipe, right? Is that the grandma's yes, recipe? Yes, exactly. Yeah, recipes are a big one. Um, <laughs> yeah. Everyone, you know, the, the big example people like to talk about is Coca-Cola. Nobody right. knows the recipe. Yeah. And only two people on the planet are yeah. the, know the actual ingredients to Coca-Cola. So, right. um, you know, trade secrets are essentially free since as long as you're able to keep it a secret. Um, and something as an intellectual property attorney um, that I would do on my end if you wanted to have something be protected as a trade secret is we'd help you put agreements in place in your business and understandings to help formalize the process of trade secrets, keeping things, um, documents, um, non-disclosure agreements, confidentiality agreements is another way to say that. Right. Um, just so we make sure if someone does spill the beans, you know, there's recourse against them right. and to stop, stop the bleeding so you can maintain that cap on your invention. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's excellent. You know, I was just thinking what, what, what popped in my brain, the light bulb went off was, um, do you, were you familiar with how like Ohio State tried to um, trademark the, right? The, or the Ohio yeah, State, yeah. right? Like, but now that one, I think fell in the, they weren't allowed to, right? Because it's so generic. Is that, yeah, that there's, yeah, there's certain things it, and University of Michigan was having a good laugh about that because, yeah. you know, they're always butting heads yeah. and they're co sometimes call themselves the University of Michigan. So, right. yeah, right. there's certain things like that that, you know, if you think of like oat brand or like it right. describes right. too much of what the invention already is or what the thing is. So you can't, you don't get the right to that. <laughs> right, right. So um, I was just recently, I was in D.C. and I was at the, uh, uh, the Air and History Museum. Um, and they, it was interesting because they, uh, they were talking about how the Wright brothers had like trademark and patented everything on flying, right? Like they owned the word flying, they invented it. So like they, <laughs> all the money they made was off of trademarking, you know, the fact that they invented this thing. 
but at some point that you know on, when i was on the tour the guy's like well this kind of just ran out because it became so i guess so broad at some point but like is there is there such a thing that you're looking for like maybe right now you own it but at some point it's just common it's just it almost becomes like electricity or it comes becomes something that's just like in our world now like when does that start to happen and how, how does that like unravel from it being like i own flying to like not anymore do you know what i mean does that make yeah, sense yeah so yeah, and I know I get what you're getting at there. Um, so anytime you trademark a word, it, we call this genericide. It's one of my favorite things to teach because it's a very fun topic. Um, so genericide occurs when a term starts to be used in ways that it's not actually intended to be. So hmm. Google is actually at a, at threat for this. So hmm. people say, oh, Google that, but they mean, you know, maybe they're on Firefox or right. Microsoft Explorer right. or whatever it may be. Um, so when people start using a word to describe everything in a category, then it starts to become at risk for losing its trademark protection. Mm -hmm. That's one of the ways that a trademark can die because yeah. it can last indefinitely. You can forget to renew it um, or you could just fail to police your mark. And so policing is another um, thing that we offer for companies to make sure to monitor the web. You know, people are posting on blogs or using something in that way. There's tools that can be utilized to make sure um, you know, and maybe education is a way to combat this. So Velcro, um, Velcro is another one. Mm. Xerox is another one. There's a is bunch Kleenex of there now? Like, like, like the, the, the Kleenex there? there? Dude, there's a bunch of examples in this category of people, things yeah. people just say to describe everything. Band-Aid, right. um, you know, there's a ton of them. Um, but Velcro has this great video and I would love to share it afterwards <laughs> with you so yeah. you can yeah. have your listeners uh, tune into it because it's, it's hilarious. It's the, the lawyers at Velcro, it's actually the attorneys um, made this video and it's really well done. It's a song actually, they're all singing and they're not actors, it's actually the, the guys and they're, they're talking about how, you know, like you gotta, this is how you use it. Like this is hook and loop, which is the actual yeah. name that Velcro is. Right. Um, so please don't call, this is Velcro, this is hook and loop. So you can't <laughs> use these interchangeably or we're gonna lose our trademark. And, and that's what the, genericide refers to is when people start using it outside of the intended use. Interesting. Yeah. I, I didn't know that there was a term for it. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's very cool. Um, so, you know, let's, let's kind of maybe circle back a little bit to, you know, uh, the, the back to the guy in the garage, walk me through first step, um, in terms of even just protecting, maybe not the full thing, but like, is it even like, if I just protected like my brand and my logo or something along those, like, or I trademark those things, does that offer me any sort of protection on like, you know, I, I, I this name equals what my product will be. Will that protect you at all just to kind of get the ball rolling? Yeah. So, um, trademarks are going to protect you when people start to try to maybe use your name or your goodwill. Um, large companies are often at threat of this. So there's a lot of benefits to registering a trademark. And one of them is custom and border patrol. So you can stop counterfeits from coming in. So if other companies that are unregistered or are starting to produce goods that have your logo on them, you know, you can go after them. You can seize the goods. You can freeze their PayPal accounts. You can reach in and get the money that they've unfairly profited by using your name and logo in commerce. Um, and it's also very dangerous um, for some companies, you know, maybe they make safety equipment or they make something that is potentially intended for one purpose. And when you're creating a counterfeit good, oftentimes it's uh, inferior quality. Mm. So it, it could be something that's causing harm to people. And then they're now associating Associate with you. that, right. that product with that of the brands. And then the brand of course doesn't want that because right. they're producing right. a good out of a certain quality and that's not actually one of theirs. So it can be really harmful. Um, I mean, Urban Decay, it's a, a makeup company. They're actually very highly, um, there's a lot of counterfeit goods in the market, right. which I find really interesting because, um, you know, makeup isn't one of those things that maybe you pay a ton of attention to. It's probably pretty easy to copy. Yeah. Um, you know, so if you start using a product and it's not as good quality, you know, you're like, oh, that brand's terrible. I'm not going to use it again. So that's definitely something that. Was, um, was, there a, was that on Netflix? Was there a Netflix show on this? Cause I, yeah, I, it's actually, yeah. um, so you probably, everyone knows about like the war on China, a lot of news around that. And that some, a lot of that involves around intellectual property theft. There's mm -hmm. a ton of intellectual property theft just because of the way that the, our policies are in the United States that are viewed very differently in China. Copying is actually 
considered a good thing in China. It's a it's a compliment to say, oh, we liked what you did so much. We're gonna do it too. So it's it's a totally different mindset. But just we're trying. The United States is trying to get China to view it differently because it's hurting American producers. Well, that's, that's actually a great jumping off point for my, my next question because we've actually had, I think in the course of us doing 10 years of crowdfunding, I think we've had two projects basically get ripped off um, by China, right? So they sent their, uh, their CAD designs there and the factory just tweaked it a little bit and ultimately was selling it on Alibaba before even producing the stuff that the Kickstarter campaign did, right? So they were yeah. just undercutting and truthfully, it comes down to like, there was just no call that like we couldn't do anything there you know we don't yeah, have enough and, budget and to fight that what what do you do right like you're just you yeah and, and that's interesting is because it's such an ever involving area that today is that um just as the counterfeiters are very creative it has to be creative on the enforcement side as well so it's like a tripart network i mean it's the inventors it's the it can, it can be law enforcement agencies and it can be other organizations such as like the lead, like I could be a part of that, trying to combat that. So we're trying to look for creative tools and it's it's never usually like a one size fits all response or answer for any individual because it depends on where it's being sold, what sources they're using, if it's the internet, you know, how and how do you even look up some of those groups because, you know, you, you're like, where the heck is this even coming from? So first you gotta kind of find who the infringer is, be able to target it down. And if it's like an ambiguous website online, there's tools that you can use to try to get where, find where they're registered, right. use the web address, and then target that person. You can send them a cease and desist letter, which mm -hmm. is a legal notice that, hey, you know, you've been notified that you're ripping off of our product, stop. Um, and then if they don't, you know, you can threaten further legal action if you're so lucky to find the source. Mm -hmm. um, and oftentimes companies, uh, they're not usually like a huge, they may not be a huge threat, so they would just, you know, want them to stop. But sometimes, and it might be like getting blood from a turnip, you know, they might have such a small operation or small pools, it's not worth it in legal costs to go after them when they're only making, you know, a couple thousand dollars right. or whatever right. it may be. But yeah, there's it's, there's a lot of, to unpack there. There's a lot of strategies yeah. involved in um, having a registered trademark or a registered patent allows you to enforce at the border so you can register your uh, device with US Customs and Borders. So that allows people to, you give them a picture of what your actual drawing is and what to look for for fakes. So they might find out for you, so you don't have to do any of the heavy lifting. Um, what if someone if someone's importing a fake good, and you can make them stop and seize it right there. So that's usually oh, a really helpful tool, especially if it's coming from another country. Yeah, interesting. You know, if the world is continuing to go as global as it already is right now, mm -hmm. how why does it matter where you might have made it? So let's say I make it here, but my audience is in. You know, I, I only sell it in. You know, I don't know. Finland, whatever. Like, mm -hmm. if this is going to become continue to become global, how does trademarks? How do we not have like just a global trademark rules as opposed to like U.S. rules? I'm sure it's different in Mexico, mm -hmm. Canada, whatever. Like, how, doesn't it make sense that we would just have a global set of standards to some degree at some point? Or yeah, so there's a couple international agencies that try to streamline the process. Um, and we're, like there's the Madrid Protocol, there's WIPO, there's all these regulatory bodies that try to make like a more centralized process to help streamline some of these things. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why with some of these, uh, you can register things in more countries at once using a streamlined process. Um, and that instead of going to each country individually, um, instead of saying, oh, hey, Finland or Mexico, or, you know, what, what may have the, all, you can register like in all European countries at once. And, you know, some, a lot of them, a lot of countries are signatories to these rules that make it easier for things to be, um, you know, patented or trademarked in more regions at once. Um, so that's really helpful. They, they, this is a, something that's been raised in the past. Um, and some, you know, most countries are part of this. Some countries aren't, which makes it a little bit more of a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, and, but then after it's submitted through these larger bodies, uh, the countries will get them individually to evaluate the, you know, for whatever criteria it may be to make sure that they are able to register it. And then you'll get registrations back from each country at uh, a staggered timing. So mm -hmm. interesting, interesting. How did you, uh, like, how did you get into this? Why, how did your, uh, you know, your uh, life trajectory get you to 
what you're doing right now. Oh, I'm so glad you asked. Um, so when I was, before I went to law school, I worked at a lobbying firm okay. and I worked with tech companies and worked with like Tesla and Uber and eBay. And I loved seeing people innovating. I loved the tech. Um, you know, I got to the um, lobbying wasn't for me, but it was really <laughs> cool to see like Tesla come on the earlier stages. Um, and this would have been like 20... 15 right. and I got to drive a Tesla and I just thought it was you know just seeing people create and innovate and bring their ideas I just thought it was like the coolest thing I, I loved the tech uh, I was always kind of like an early adopter of tech and even you know I, was, I had the newest iPhone for a while <laughs> and I just I'm, I'm fascinated by it I love it and getting to be a part of that process and help people bring their ideas forward is just something I always wanted to do and I actually entered law school with that goal and you know, I'm, I'm so happy that I got to carry it on. I was like the president of the Intellectual Property Law Society for a few years. So this has just been a passion of mine. Yeah. Um, so I consider myself very fortunate to do something that I've dreamed of, really. So yeah. Have you ever made, have you ever made anything? You, have you designed anything? Do you have a, you know, you have... I have a couple ideas of things that I would <laughs> like to see, but you know, I, I, it's, it's, it hasn't come to the table yet. So yeah. I'm not going to spoil it here, unfortunately. Yeah, but, well, you'll be able to trademark it, right? That's your, you yeah, can, I mean, I, I hope um, I have some family members who do stuff like that and I kind of help help them every once in a while but um, yeah I have I don't have any of my own inventions out there yet. <laughs> How about for, you know for the local listeners because I you know we do have a pretty good audience size around here uh, Detroit area how, how is the community here in terms of supporting are there like in terms of resources I mean you and I we met at a uh, you know at a meetup group but like where what are you seeing maybe even through like the law firm in terms of like support um, uh, innovation going on here like like what's your temperature on our area right now yeah so I I'm, I think it's awesome actually there's a lot of groups in Detroit Ann Arbor East Lansing um, and since it is a growing thing like universities have even started to create like entrepreneurial clubs and meetings that kind of bring together these resources to help entrepreneurs and to help inventors um, understand what it is they need to help connect them with resources and funds to get their project off the ground and get them connected with like-minded individuals so they can have a community and place to bounce ideas off of so they're not alone. And so I really think collecting those types of people from you know support communities, we're in the same boat, legal sources to help get the idea grounded, and then money to that so everyone needs to get that off the ground is crucial. And so many of these little areas have recognize that in different degrees, even if it's helping um, at the educational level or just bringing together those groups. Um, Meetup.com has a bunch. Eventbrite, I'll see things on there. And, you know, I'm a huge uh, supporter of networking. Yeah, I just think going to these events and getting to see faces and talk to different people from different backgrounds, the more you can listen to somebody else's point of view and really understand where they're coming from. I think it help you can incorporate that into your own and help understand what you need to do next. Sure. So sure. You, you can totally, I mean, you just, you just never know where you're going to meet someone that'll help you. Um, so I, I, I think that the Detroit area is doing a lot. I think even Detroit itself is starting to blossom and I think more people are starting to pour money back into the area. Um, so I'm really happy to see all the different groups and everything that's been going on in the area of late. Yeah, that's very cool. Very cool. How about, you know, without getting into specifics on, on this next question, but what are like ballpark in terms of like pricing? And I'm sure this could be all over the place, but like when, what is somebody kind of expecting to sort of spend to at least have some protection again, early stage, early in their startup? Is there a sort of a, a at least a, a goalpost between, you know, or is it all over the place? Yeah, it really is all over the place. And again, it kind of depends on what you're looking for. Um, so, I mean, we'll offer some flat rate, flat rate pricing. We'll offer some packages, um, you know, just kind of, we'll, we'll, we're willing to work with you and try to see like what's feasible within what your options mm -hmm. are and what you want. Um, so I think we're, especially for inventors who don't have maybe all the resources, um, we've even, um, use people who, have, who only have grant money. We're flexible about how the spending is. Um, but it just kind of depends, like obviously, uh, uh, things that are more have more protection are going to be more expensive. So a patent is usually the most expensive. Right, um, right. But even if, if you wanted to protect something as a trade secret, you know, that could, that would probably be one of the lower ones if we wanted to just talk about structuring of agreements or things of that nature to help you put those protocols in place and measures to help protect your idea. 
Um, so we're, I mean, there's a ton of strategies and tools, just kind of depending on what you want. The pricing varies based on that. Is it, you know, so like I get a lot of questions of like, how much am I going to spend in marketing? You know, how much am I going to spend in Facebook ads? It's like, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, a yeah. million tomorrow. I don't know, you know, um, but I at least I'm, I'm usually like, man, you know, with all the data and everything I've ever seen, I'm always like, yeah, we're probably spending 30% of, you know, of, for the year. Something Is there even like a percentage that you typically, I'm like, most people are 10% of their budget for the year or 5% or is there e really even in this scenario, it's not quite like that. Yeah, um, I mean, it's up to every in organization or business, depending on what their goals are. But, uh, you know, if you really want a patent, that is an awesome marketing tool. Mm -hmm. So it allows you to have the exclusive right to allow your business to use and exploit that invention um, for 20 years from the filing date of the invention. Mm -hmm. So that's it gives you a strong market predict. Put, uh, sorry, strong market position. Yeah. Um, so, because their exclusive rights are able to prevent others from commercially using your invention, and thereby you reduce competition and establish yourself in the market as a strong player. And you're also able to get higher returns on investment. So, having invested a considerable amount of money and time in developing your product, uh, you could use this as an umbrella of exclusive rights to commercialize your invention, thus enabling you to have higher returns and investments. Um, it's also an opportunity to license. Um, so if you see this as something that you're willing to allow others to also use, you could exploit that patent um, yourself or you could sell it and license the right. So there's different strategies that you could have depending on you know, how much of your patent you're willing to share with others. Um, it also increases your negotiating power. So if your business is in the process of acquiring the rights to use the patents uh, of another enterprise, through a licensing contract, your patent portfolio will enhance your bargaining power. Sure. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, and it also gives you a positive image. You know, if, it's kind of like going back to the Shark Tank example. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, you explain that puts your level of expertise and specialization of your company out there so people feel comfortable investing in you. They feel uncomfortable um, with your knowledge. So it just gives you a whole plethora of rights. So it's really worth investing some of the money and time into these things yeah. because yeah. you just get that much more return on your investment. Sure, sure. How, what about a time frame for what you're talking about? Like, let's say I, I come to you and I say, I, I got to get this thing patented. You know, am I looking well, at- Well, it's, it's a long process. Yeah. So it's better to bring your idea out there early, especially if you see this being a market um, that might be a quick turnaround. Um, so, you know, the earlier the better. Um, the patenting process varies considerably and it just kind of depends on what's out there and, you know, and it usually takes a, at least a year. So it's, it's, it's pretty slow. Um, but there's design patents are usually faster. Those can be done in, you know, more like months. Maybe mm -hmm. that can be done under a year. Um, so, a, you know, a trademark could be shorter than that too, under a year. Yeah. Um, copyrights can be those are one of the quicker ones. Trade secrets, you know, you already you already have them. You just got to keep it a secret. Right, right, right. Um, so just depending on what you need, you know, um, but patents are usually take the longest to receive a granted right. On. Awesome. Awesome. How can people like reach out to you? How can they find you uh, if they have questions or listen to this and they're like, well, I, I need to get some stuff done here. How do they reach yeah. out to you and find you? Yes. So they can email me or they can call my office. Um, so the phone here is 248. 380-9300 and I'm extension 140 or you can reach me um, at e Erickson so e and then e again r-i-c-k-s-o-n at quinnipilaw.com cool are you comfortable with us putting that in the uh, show notes so people can reach out yeah yeah awesome, absolutely awesome, go awesome. ahead awesome. I, I'd love a Appreciate shout out <laughs> awesome awesome Elizabeth I thank you so much for taking time out of your day this was a great conversation uh, I know I've learned a lot uh, so hopefully all my listeners out there are, uh, are learning as well so again, thanks yeah. so much for your time. I totally appreciate it. It was awesome. No problem. I appreciate you putting me on the show, Jeff. And if they have any questions or anything that's like spins off from this, you know, I, I think there's a lot to really dive into here. Um, you know, I'd be more than happy to come back on the show and answer some more specific questions or follow up in the notes. Yeah. So it'd be great. Awesome. Yeah, I will. I will let you know uh, what the feedback's like. So thanks again. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Bye. I hope you guys enjoyed that interview with Elizabeth. Again, like we said in the episode, if you want to reach out, 
go over to woodshed.agency right now. You can look for episode 170. Uh, all the information's in the show notes. And reach out if you got questions on trademarking or IP or brand management, all that sort of stuff. Um, uh, Elizabeth will be more than happy to uh, take your call and, and uh, help you guys out as much as possible. So with all that said, like I talked about before, we've got the Sun Pilots coming up next. Uh, this was recorded about six years ago at, at Groovebox Studios. Uh, and remember, it's all live, all uh, all done in one take. So it's one band, one room, one take. And I uh, hope you guys enjoy. Have a great weekend. And uh, make sure you, again, you uh, smash all those subscribe buttons out there too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or leave a review. Reviews help out as well. So, all right, guys. Here's the Sun Pilots uh, live from Groovebox Studios. Check it out. Don't you worry Cause contracts are broken All of the time He'll never collect So sudden Sleep tight Face yourself In his mirrors Save your Free!